you. Um, and just so everybody knows, we are recording this today because we have someone who would really like to hear this talk but couldn't uh, make it just because of scheduling difficulties. Um, so Dr. Phil Heron started at uh, University of Leeds uh, and then earned his PhD from the University of Toronto in 2014. We were just discussing that I was actually on his advisory committee and he defended, you know, and uh, between two of my children. Um, <laughs> And it was a lot of fun uh, to interact with Phil back then. And I'm really happy that he's returned to U of T. Uh, he had a few years of postdocing at U of T and then he went on to two different fellowships at uh, Durham University. One was a co-fund junior research fellowship in geodynamics. And then he did a Marie Curie research fellowship which is quite prestigious. Um, I'm not sure what this is. He had a short stint as an operational researcher for the UK government. Uh, and then he joined UTSC in 2020, 20, sorry, 2021, so last fall, but uh, just actually physically arrived in the country um, about two weeks ago. Um, this is interesting in honor of Phil's recent arrival and uh, the changing regulations around COVID. This was actually our first in-person colloquium visit, believe it or not, in, in two years. So Phil is actually delivering this lecture from one of our teaching booths right across from the administrative you know, people in our, in our CPS area. Uh, and he had a bunch of in-person visits with people today, including lunch, and he's going out for dinner. Unfortunately, I was supposed to be there and I can't because I'm just sick enough that I can't come in and contaminate other people. Uh, but it's really nice to be getting back to, um, you know, back to this uh, kind of in-person stuff and I look forward to it next year. Um, now about Phil's research, it is uh, pretty astounding. I just um, had a quick perusal through his website and looking at his CV. It's incredibly broad, um, both with traditional research and then beyond that as well. Um, so he does a lot of modeling. Uh, he's gonna be talking about supercontinents today. Um, many of you, most of you hopefully have heard of um, Pangaea, but this one is farther back in time, Panotia, and uh, it gets harder, just so you know, the farther back in time you go. Um, he's also looked at modeling continental rifts and mantle dynamics, looking in particular at the effect of inheritance on how these features developed. Um, also, really fascinating work. Um, Phil, I read this paper when I saw it on your CV because I thought it looked so cool and hadn't seen it before on the use of, or actually the misuse of color in science communication. It definitely will change my use of rainbows. Um, <laughs> and uh, this is um, also a really cool. Phil has done some work on unlocking the doors to education for prisoners. Um, and I will definitely be asking you about that later when we get a chance to meet, because that sounds amazing. So with that, um, Phil, thank you so much for coming in person, for being with us here today and sharing your really amazing research with us. So please take it away. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, that, that, yeah, there's a lot of things going on with that, with that introduction. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen and then we can, we can begin. I'm on I'm on one um, on one laptop today. I don't have two screens, so uh, I, I apologize. I, won't, I should be able, I won't be able to see any chat. Well, I could try. So if anyone, if anyone has a question, just feel free to stop me. Um, thanks very much for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure. I don't know how if my voice is going to be able to last because I've been talking to in-person people for the first time in two years. It's been quite exciting. Um, as Lindsay mentioned, you know I'm at I'm at UTSC. This is work that I've been doing over a number of years, uh, quite a long time now, with, with a few different co-authors that, that are on there. Just to make sure, can you see my mouse, actually? Lindsay? Yeah, grand. So uh, I'm going to be talking about what makes a supercontinent super, but just to, to point out that um, I, I am from England. This is where England is on this map of Pangaea, so we've done 20 million years ago. And I've recently just arrived at UTSC Scarborough. So it's, yeah, as, as Lindsay said, but it's been about two weeks. So I apologize, I've been in the UK five years. My accent is probably at peak uh, English accent and I'm gonna try and tone it down a little bit uh, to try and make it supremely understandable. Uh, now, th there's a few things I kind of want to do with this talk. Um, it's a colloquium talk, I'm not gonna, it's not gonna be super specific and go into a lot of details. One of the kind of main things I want to do today is kind of introduce myself and the many things that I do and just to kind of say hi. As I said, I've moved to UTSC. Uh, it's not too far away. A number of people actually live in Scarborough, I found out uh, from the department and, and in and around Toronto. Uh, I'm going to be around here for a long time. So I kind of want to introduce myself to, to the UTM just to say hi. And there surely be things we can work on. And I'm always around and up for collaboration. Um, I want to talk about supercontinents and I want to talk a bit about science communication, which Lindsay alluded to with that paper. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about that kind of towards the end. Um, but they're my general goals for today. Introduce myself, talk about supercontinents, talk about science communication, 
not lofty goals, but we'll, 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 go, we'll go through it in the next 40 or so minutes. Um, so the kind of main question I have for today is what makes a supercontinent super? Seems a really obvious question and a really kind of thing that should have an, an easy answer. Um, this is an image here of, of Pangaea, supercontinent from 320 million years ago to, to its breakup, kind of around 200, 180 million years, all in all. What you're seeing here is a collection of the continental material as one. You've got Laurentia, which is North America, Baltica, which is in uh, Northwest Europe, uh, Amazonia, Gondwana, and Siberia. Um, the big question is what I thought the supercontinent was, was the collection of all of the continental material as one. Um, but actually, if you look at Pangaea, there's a couple of bits that aren't connected. Uh, so it's definitely not all of the supercontinent, all the continental material as one. It's definitely not the case. That's definitely not what definition of a supercontinent is. Um, because even Pangaea, the kind of famous supercontinent, the most recent one, doesn't have all the continental material attached. So um, last year at CGU, I, I was giving this talk on what makes a supercontinent super, and, and I ran a little Twitter poll asking, uh, <laughs> that's how sad I am, I thought it'd be fun to open up a question on Twitter uh, on what makes a supercontinent super, and I gave four, four different choices. Um, it, it, essentially, how do you define a supercontinent? Do you define it by its size, its impact, both or other? So as a kind of thought experiment to get us going, you can write in the chat or just think about it. How would you answer this? Uh, your initial thought is, is how would, what, what would you say? What makes a supercontinent super? Would it be its size, its impact, uh, or both? Um, size, size, yeah, I can see the chat. I don't know, yeah, size, yeah, size, size. Um, what, what type of size is, is a big question. So, um, the 56 votes, you're expecting to be thousands of votes. My Twitter follower isn't that big, sadly, but most people, yeah, it's size. You know, 60 odd percent say it's it's size of a supercontinent is what defines a supercontinent. What makes it super is, is its size. And that's what I thought, that's what I think. And, uh, but the question is, what size? What, what, what size <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it all of it? It's clearly not all of it because Pangaea doesn't count. Um, here we have uh, Pangaea and Rodinia, Rodinia from 900 uh, million years ago. We've got Laurentia, Amazonia, and Balta together. Two very different sized supercontinents that we define, that, we, that people talk about as supercontinents. What percentage of continental material is that? Is it, it's not 100%, is it 90%, is it 75%? A lot of academics talk about 75% being a, being a kind of threshold, but I don't think we didn't even count as 25 as 75%. So we're in a kind of a, an interesting situation where for something as simple as anyone who's entered into the field of earth science, or even popular culture really will know about a supercontinent. The big thing is that we actually don't have a formal definition of a supercontinent. We just don't have one. And to me, that is, a, that is incredible that we don't have a formal definition of what actually makes a supercontinent. We have an idea of size, but we don't actually have a definition of it. And what I'm going to show you is that actually can make it a bit difficult when you actually start talking about supercontinents. Uh, but for now, we're going to go back to basics. Um, I'm aware this is a colloquium talk, so I'm just going to talk a little bit uh, about the supercontinents and supercontinent cycle to get everyone really on the same page. So um, there's, there's been more than one supercontinent in, in, in the past in, in its history. And we talk about them in terms of a supercontinent cycle and that they kind of form and, and reform and break up and form. Now, what you're going to see is four images that I've drawn. Uh, this, if you look at it carefully, is a cartoon of the Earth. <laughs> These green things here, they're meant to be continents. And this blue thing here is meant to be oceanic subduction. So uh, when a supercontinent forms, generally forms the fact that you've got continental material and continental material forming together. You've got an ocean in between that's closing and subduction coming down. And eventually they form together to form one continent, a supercontinent. That's what this is meant to show. And this is the core. Um, from there, you have, um, you've, you've kind of stopped that initial subduction. That interior ocean is closed and it cuts off that interior subduction. So now you don't have any subduction inside any ocean material going in inside that continental material. 
and it's a kind of a seems kind of almost a, a passive thing but the super the the subduction then reforms on the earth to form on the edges of the continental margin because continental material doesn't doesn't subduct as well as uh, oceanic material so now you have motion where on the edges of the supercontinent you have oceanic material being subducted in and this generally what you generally have when you have a supercontinent form is you have an increase of large igneous provinces uh, kind of large plume material coming up uh, which i'm going to talk about a little bit more detail in a second and then eventually you have these green bits then moving apart and changing the, the configuration again. And then once again, over time, how long? We don't know. The cycle starts again when the continental material forms, forms a supercontinent moves on. So these lovely di diagrams uh, are your kind of general supercontinent cycle. Um, so let's look at that in action. Uh, I'm just going to move. I think so. This is this is going to. I'm just going to show you now some plate tectonics over the next over 410 million years to the present day. So what you're seeing here is the green is continental material, the purple is subduction zones that are going in oceanic material that's being pushed into into the mantle. The blue uh, here are are ocean ridges being formed. Those are the keen eye. You can see uh, North America uh, over here, 410 million years ago, and you've got. Uh, Europe there, uh, Mauritius, South America, and you've got Africa, you've got Australia, India, Antarctica, and the rest. So what we're going to see is the continental change over a period of time. So what you're seeing now is actually that formation stage where you've got oceanic subduction bringing together continental material. This is plate reconstruction history. Um, uh, put into it by Matthews et al. Put into a, a nice, very nice video. So now you've got the formation of a supercontinent here. You had oceanic material form an interior, a closing an interior ocean to form Pangaea. So now you've got one large supercontinent, and you've got in the purple here, you've got ring subduction around the outside. You've got no interior subduction. And what that's doing is it's causing a number of different uh, issues uh, inside the mantle. You've got a reposition of mantle dynamics, and now you're going to start to see lots of large igneous provinces. Uh, occurring central Atlantic magmatic province, which has already occurred. Um, you've got around here, you've got the uh, large igneous province occurring around 130 million years ago, which we were talking about today. Um, and you're going to start to see the breakup of the supercontinent. My favorite part in all of this is the fact that you've got India just detaching from Madagascar and ramming into uh, Asia to form the Himalayas. But also more subtly, you'll start to see Australia take off north um, in a bid to try and be closer to the to the rest of the world and to try and reduce that flight time. I think it's a good tourist ploy to kind of come closer. Um, there you have, you actually have a little bit of supercontinent cycle in action here. Um, you've, you've seen continental formation, you've seen an interior, you've seen the, the surface manifestations of a supercontinent form. So I'll hopefully give you a little bit more context of what's happening. And it's also just a really excellent video. Um, so actually, when you form a supercontinent, to kind of go into a bit more detail, there's kind of two ways mainly you can form one. Here you have uh, an image of a supercontinent kind of looking down. This brown is, is, is a supercontinent here uh, with some kind of volcanic arcs on the side with some volcanic uh, relate, volcanics related to subduction. And then when a supercontinent breaks up, shown here uh, by these segments of the continent breaking apart, you can have an exterior ocean, which is an ocean which is uh, outside of where the supercontinent formed in an interior ocean, which is forming in the area where the supercontinent once was, there's two ways then a supercontinent could reform. If um, you have it so the exterior ocean closes and a supercontinent forms again, that is called extraversion, which is the closure of an exterior ocean. And if that interior ocean collapses to form a uh, a supercontinent, you have introversion, it's closing the interior ocean. So here you'd have um, these brown layers are passive margins for all you passive margins fans. Um, when you have passive margins against uh, collision and erog collisional, collisional erogeny, that's a kind of introversion. It's kind of a good sign of it. Whereas you've got passive margins here uh, on the outside of your, of your supercontinent, that's more extraversion. So that's kind of a more of a technical description of, of supercontinent formation for all you uh, passive margins fans, which I know there are a few on this talk, on this call. 
Um, and that's actually really important in trying to understand future supercontinents. So we've got potentially four different um, future supercontinents that could occur. Here you have uh, the future supercontinent Orica, uh, which is if the Pacific and the Atlantic actually closed together, you would get this kind of jumble uh, called Orica. Uh, Novo Pangaea is if the kind of the exterior ocean, Pacific, extraversion, uh, the Pacific started to continue to, to collapse. You we think that we'd get Novo Pangaea, so that's extraversion. Uh, we've got Pangaea Ultima, which is more introversion, where the Atlantic, as it's started to grow, has actually started to collapse in on itself over time and, and form form uh, introversion supercontinent. And then you've got a major, which is a kind of closure of the Atlant of the Arctic Ocean in a process called orthoversion. So you've got, uh, got four different uh, future supercontinents there that we that we don't quite know, and we're trying to understand how the dynamics uh, would form to to form these different types based on based on what's been before. So you kind of four different potential future supercontinents. And actually, what's the date today? Sixth on uh, on Monday, on the third of April, is actually a really nice um, BBC article on how the next supercontinent will form, uh, which um, I would recommend you reading if you if you're interested. It's um, it's, it's basically what I just mentioned there. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting. But talking about how ocean, how how um, oceans are closed in the form, and I can't I can't be sat in Mississauga, Arendelle, and not talk about the Wilson cycle uh, in, in some way because um, I did my PhD downtown in, in the physics department, and outside my graduate office was a was a painting of Tuzo Wilson. So this is a picture of, um, I think it must have it must have absorbed that painting over the five years I was there. Uh, because now all I do is plate tectonic stuff and Wilson cycle stuff. Um, and I don't think I was meant to, but I've just inherited that from, from being walking past that painting every day for five years. So supercontinent cycles mired in understanding how the oceans form and close and the Wilson cycle is basically the life cycle of an ocean. So um, the Wilson cycle is, is, is all your plate tectonic features rolled into one. Let's just say you have a, a stable, stable, continent, stable craton, um, you have the birth of an ocean when a continent starts to break apart, seen today in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and that's the oceanic spreading. Um, and then you've got oceanic material starting to die in terms of oceanic subduction, today happening in the west of South America, where the Pacific is, is slowly collapsing. Uh, and then you have continental collision, where the continents, that ocean's now closed, and you've got two continents colliding into each other, again, creating an example today would be India and in, into Eurasia creating the Himalayas. So that's a kind of, that's the Wilson cycle, but it's also a snapshot of how the supercontinent cycles work and all these introversion and extraversion um, formulation of supercontinents. So it's all related and I feel like I just had to talk about Tuzo Wilson being here. It's kind of quite exciting to, to be in an area where he was and to talk about this sort of stuff. So it's a tip of the, my tip of the cap to, to J Tuzo Wilson. Um, so what, what's kind of exciting and interesting as well is that a lot of the supercontinent cycle is based on oceanic dynamics. But if you look at an ocean lifespan, shown here uh, with a kind of a funky projection of continental material and oceanic age going from zero to two million years, uh, that the oceanic lifespan's mega short in terms of Earth history. That image, I, the video I showed from 410 million years ago, uh, there's no content, oceanic material from the start of that video, 410 million, million years ago, that is on the surface today. Um, the oldest ocean is 200 million years ago. So the oceanic lifespan is really short, which means uh, has really large implications, I think, for something like the supercontinent cycle, which is a really strongly linked to oceans closing. Um, so what does that mean exactly? If you've got oceanic material being drawn down into the mantle, you know, every 200 million years, and the supercontinent cycle is has this huge repositioning of subduction zones, 
they can have an impact on the interior of the mantle. You've got a lot of oceanic material coming down and potentially changing the, the configuration of how mantle flow comes. And this is what I've been working on with a number of papers over 12 years now of how that reposition of subduction zones can start to change uh, the interior of how a supercontinent works. Um, and we think that that changing of oceanic material, that, that dropping the oceanic material down into the mantle can generate large igneous provinces, come and, can generate kind of a return flow of material coming from the edge to produce uh, large igneous province plume-like material from the core mantle boundary up into the surface. And there's a strong link between supercontinents forming and the generation of, of large igneous provinces. Now I'm aware that not everyone might know what I'm talking about when I talk about large igneous provinces. So uh, if you think about it in terms of a volcano, uh, a volcano eruption at the surface, um, well, actually, you know, I'll, I'll kind of talk through this slide first. So the reason why oceanics, I think oceanic material is important is because, yeah, you've got a lot of the subducted ocean material coming in and interacting uh, with the, the core mantle boundary, generating this re return flow, which I just talked about. Um, and interacting with material near the core mantle boundary to generate large igneous provinces shown here by this kind of return flow. What's also interesting, and there's a talk, and in talk in its entirety, another hour long talk in itself, is that um, seismic tomography uh, reveals potentially uh, piles of material at the core mantle boundary, known as LLSVPs, or referred to here as piles. Now, underneath the previous position of supercontinent Pangaea, there's a large LSVP right underneath Africa, and there's one large one underneath the Pacific. We don't quite know what this material is. We think it's uh, thermochemical in nature, it's slightly different material than, than what it's surrounding. And this is what it kind of looks like if you look at a seismic tomography of, uh, of 2,800 kilometers depth. You have a, a, a low shear wave velocity so when the seismic waves come down, it, they travel through this region a lot slower than they would, indicating they might be a little bit hotter uh, and maybe potentially denser than, than the surrounding material. So this outline here, this red underneath Africa on the core mantle boundary kind of sits in near the area of where Pangaea was. And underneath the Pacific here, we've got one, we've got one here. But what you've had during the supercontinent formation is oceanic material in this region pouring in on the sides, on the supercontinent, um, on the margins of the supercontinent. So surrounding these LSVPs, you've just got oceanic material coming in. And we think in a number of papers, we've talked about the potential to have this acting as a push broom, pushing up, um, pushing up hot plume-like material up into the surface in the form of lodging these provinces. Now, LSVPs, they are potentially the largest thing in our planet that we know the least about. There's a number of different theories on, on how they behave, whether they're static, whether they're, they're rigid. Um, but one thing seems to be relatively clear is that large igneous provinces can form on their margins. But again, what did I mean to about large igneous provinces? So if you think about large igneous provinces as a volcano, um, this is the 2010 eruption uh, does anyone know how to pronounce this, this volcano? No, Lindsay, anyone? If you can pronounce it, can you please come off mute and pronounce it for me? No one? Damn, I was hoping someone would be an Icelandic speaker. So uh, this, this eruption, does anyone actually remember this eruption uh, from 2010? Yeah. Um, so it was, a, it was a large eruption. Well, not even that a large eruption actually that occurred. And this image on the right here, um, shows the ash cloud from, um, from this earthquake and it covered most of Northern Europe. Uh, and it was a pretty big deal. If you see this as the normal flight path, I think, it, yeah, it, it, occurred, it occurred about the 15th of October, uh, April, 2010. And this is a general flight path for that day, how many flights you generally see. And this is what happened uh, in the days around it, just totally grounded the flights. Um, I've given this talk many times, actually. Was anyone impacted by this particular volcano? If you, if you work, you just message it in the chat or come off mute. Anyone was impacted by it, had any kind of, any sort of delay related to it? No one? I was, I was trapped in New Zealand for three weeks because of it. Well, I've given this talk everywhere. I've given it in prisons. I've given it uh, to 
people in an old, in a lifelong learning environment, and there's never been one person, there's never been one place where someone wasn't affected by it. Um, so it, it was a small earthquake, a small volcano, but it affected you. It was trapped for two weeks, and I, you know, oh, poor you. Well, where's my violin? <laughs> oh, no, what a nightmare. It was horrible. It was <laughs> so bad. I just had the worst time. I bet. Oh, man, that's terrible. Yeah, so it's a, yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a volcano that occurred and caused worldwide disruption, including to Scott. Terrible time. Um, uh, I'd, I'd give a talk in prison actually, and 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 they said the person person talking about it said they were in Edinburgh, uh, which is about here, and they had ash on the tops of cars from this volcano. Worldwide devastation, world but not devastation, but worldwide disruption. Now that's a volcano. A large English province is slightly different. A large English province here, shown 201 million years ago by the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. This is the configuration of, of uh, Laurasia and Gondwana. This, the, the, this red outline is not the ash cloud. This is the lava flow that occurred from this. So significantly larger than the ash cloud. I mean, all the dinosaurs, they couldn't catch their flights. They were stuck. They couldn't, they couldn't, get, they couldn't travel. A nightmare they couldn't oh. uh, but it lasted for i think a hundred thousand years the the eruption and there was uh, seven or eight different different eruption sites so significantly larger and we think that potentially some larging is are are linked to the supercontinent cycle and the reposition of the subduction zone a theory another theory is that um super volcanoes kind of oh, oh yeah they also relate to mass extinction events i couldn't find a figure for mass extinction events this looks this is also New Zealand. <laughs> it's a Scott somewhere down there. Um, but this is also, um, yeah, so it also related to mass extinction. So I'm trying to paint a picture of why this sort of thing is important to try and understand uh, supercontinent cycles and to try and understand supercontinents. You're actually linking into a number of different fields, looking into lodging this province analysis, mass extinction events as well. Um, there's also another area uh, that could form from from supercontinents and potential breakup, and this is, I've, I've drawn this image, so bear with me, is if you have a supercontinent on top of, on top of a mantle with surrounded by oceanic material, uh, generally you have high heat flow going through oceanic material, but because of the, of the buoyancy of continental material, it is a lot less uh, heat flow that goes through a continent. And if you have a, a large amount of, of a supercontinent, say, sitting in, a, in one position for a significant length of time, you could get a buildup of, of heat um, not being able to 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 pass through in, uh, out, out of the surface, and you could get some sort of continental insulation, which could generate other sort of mechanisms within the within the surface uh, underneath the surface, which could lead to breakup as well. So there's a lot of things that could go on. So um, kind of in terms of earth it's earth science and, and geodynamics, there's a lot of different processes that can go on in a, in a in a in a in a, in a supercontinent cycle that has shaped our planet. Um, so here we have it again, supercontinent cycle, a lot of different processes going on across a number of different fields, but kind of quite important to understand. If you like them pictures, but couldn't understand my accent, I've written a paper on this. Uh, it's a review paper and it's really, it's open access and it was for a uh, 50th anniversary of the, of the Wilson cycle. Um, and it kind of covers all these topics in, in a bit more detail. So if, you, if you're interested in this, um, there's, a, there's a paper on mantle plumes and mantle dynamics in the Wilson cycle, which I uh, I'd recommend you read if, again, my accent is too much. Uh, I can't say you would like the pictures because I've, I've drawn most of them. So let's get back to it. What makes a supercontinent super? So we have got two, we've got two, we've got two things here. Size is, is not quite work. Um, it, size is a hard thing to pin down. Uh, luckily, there's not, because of that supercontinent cycle, there's a number of other different geomarkers, we call them, that we can use to identify a supercontinent cycle. So it's not just size. It was a kind of misleading what the, um, what the Twitter question was. Um, we have a number of different geomarkers. We've got global scale orogenesis. You know, you've got continents coming in together to form a supercontinent. So you've got a lot of mountain building that's occurring. You've got global scale orogenesis. That's one geomarker. You've got crustal growth. You've got rapid climate swings from the config rapid configuration of continental material change in the atmosphere. You've got major life and atmospheric events. I think it's probably related to the mass extinction events as well. But you've got a change in the atmosphere too. 
you've got sea level change and you've got large igneous provinces. The reason why I've chosen supercontinents for this talk is because it covers a number of different fields of research within earth and sciences and life sciences too. So these geomarkers are really important. We don't just look at size, we look at geomarkers too. And Pangaea and Rodinia all tick these markers. You've got, you've got, uh, you can tick all these. They all have these, these, you can, you can look, go back in earth history and you can see these, uh, these examples of them. Um, however, it still doesn't get, I mean, just listing all these as, as some sort of, of checklist is not really a definition. Um, a paper came out by Daniel Pastor Galan in 2018, trying to tackle this idea of a definition of a supercontinent, which you don't have. And they kind of came up with a, an understanding of what the, the kind of mantle impact would be, seen as this supercontinent, Happel, it has an impact on the whole whole planet um, and they suggest that a supercontinent uh, should be defined as as a single continental plate with a size capable of modifying or controlling mantle dynamics and core mantle boundary processes altering convection cells and enhancing thermal activity now as a man who worked for 12 years looking at mantle dynamics and supercontinents and never thought to come up with a definition based on that i thought this was amazing i was really impressed by this i thought this is a really interesting way to come about a definition it's not about the size of it it's about the impact and then potentially the impact on what happens in the interior of the planet i love this so much that i think this is sort of a quote that you would find on an, an inspirational quote like you'd have here like a lovely little background so here it is as an inspirational quote um, i've printed these off you'll be able to find them around the department for the next couple of weeks um, something inspirational for you all I'm really interested in this and it is decided that we can try and maybe look at definition of a supercontinent in a different way. So I'm going to take a few minutes now to kind of introduce myself in a little bit. So I've been doing numerical modeling on and off since 2007. First kind of numerical modeling I've done uh, was with Coulomb, which is a kind of uh, Coulomb stress change code uh, where I modeled volcano tectonic uh, stress changes seen here by, by this lovely image. I then went on to use a mantle dynamics code called MC3D for my PhD. Uh, this, this took three months to do this, this uh, 3D image. It took ages, uh, but it was part of my PhD. This is what I modeled supercontinent cycle being. Um, uh, and then uh, I did, I moved over with, with Russ at, uh, in downtown campus and used SOPAL, which is a geodynamics code, which Lindsay's well aware of, I think. Uh, to do kind of mantle dynamics and lithosphere tectonics uh, using this code. And then for the past five years, so there's a number of different regions there. I've done kind of really kind of <laughs> earthquake size, tiny deformation to global scale mantle dynamics to lithosphere scale. So I've covered a lot of different sizes, but now I've been using this code called ASPECT, which uh, stands for Advanced Solver for Problems in Earth's Convection. And it's an it's a open source code doing geodynamic processes. The image here shows whole mantle convection, but actually uh, it's, its mission is to provide geosciences with well-documented code for research needs. So it can use a number of different things. And it's really open and inclusive, and it's a wonderful code to use. Uh, I've used it to, to look at mountain building and, and oh, just mentioned what, what it was called, Wachita. That's not, that's not how you pronounce it. Uh, what is it, Lindsay? Owashita. Yeah, that's it. Sorry. Uh, to look at the dynamics of Wachita Mountains. Uh, and I've looked at the Davis Strait in, in uh, model and rifting of the Davis Strait. I can pronounce that uh, just. And, um, but it can be used for melt, crustal deformation, lithosphere, grain evolution, mantle dynamics. It's a kind of jack of all trades. And if anyone's interested, I can happily give a talk on this as well. Uh, but I've been using this code to look at. Um, the mantle dynamics. So for me, the, what I kind of used this code for is, is, is a quote, another quote uh, from John Hernland uh, at, a, at a SETI meeting, which is a study of the steep interior. And he said that um, the, the role of numerical models is to basically provide fancy cartoons to supplement a theory. Um, and that's what I kind of generally do. If you have an idea and have a theory, you can try and provide some numerical modeling to kind of see if it it works or see what the boundaries are, limitations potentially. So you're not going to solve a problem 
per se with it, or I can't anyway, but you can provide some in context and, and, and to kind of run a lot of different models to try and supplement the theory. Again, I'll print this off and you can, you can find them around the department. Um, but getting back to it, we don't have a formal definition of a supercontinent. And this is another inspirational quote. I'm just going wild on them now. Uh, we don't have a formal definition of a supercontinent. And I use numerical modeling to try and try and find that definition, try and try and supplement using that uh, Daniel uh, Pastor Galan definition of how the mantle dynamics work to try and to try and um, see if that theory can come in uh, using numerical modeling to define how a supercontinent works. So yeah, Lindsay alluded alluded to this in the in the in the talk. <laughs> I was really I just spelled Penosha wrong. Um, yeah, ignore that. Um, so the, the reason why we don't have, the reason why it's a problem that we don't have a formal definition of a supercontinent is because there's there's a lot of uh, ideas on what could also be classified as a supercontinent. So if you have seven hundred million years ago. Um, you have uh, to 650 million years ago, you've got Laurentia, uh, Amazonia, Baltica, and Siberia coming here. The blue here is subduction. Uh, 650 million years ago, you've got a collection of continental material loosely collected called Penosha. Now, um, a, a number of people, including Brendan and Damien, who I work with, have suggested that this is a supercontinent. And uh, because it has a lot of the characteristics of it, it is tiny. It is a tiny, it wouldn't classify as a sizable collection or even a very contiguous collection of continental material, but it, um, it, it potentially could be classified as a supercontinent, rightly or wrongly. Now, 650 it kind of formed it, it was only around for a very short period of time, probably less than 100 million years. Uh, but what happened around 600 million years, you had the formation of a large igneous province, um, the central Iapetus magmatic province shown here. Uh, and then it's break up in about 550, where you have, you know, Amazonia, Laurentia, Siberia, and Baltica breaking up. So you've got the generation of, of a large igneous province, but um, also you, for Penosha, you had global scale orogenesis, you've got crustal growth, rapid climate swings, major life atmospheric events, sea level, you have all the characteristics potentially of a supercontinent but its size. Um, so we thought in a paper, we'd be interested to kind of run some mantle dynamics to try and compare Pangaea, Rodinia, and Penosia to see if there's any kind of comparison between them. And that's the, this is why I see the role of, of numerical model in there. Again, yeah, fancy cartoons to supplement the theory. So we're looking for the mantle fingerprint of a supercontinent. So if we run a numerical model, can you see something similar in all three models? So I used Aspect uh, to run a whole mantle convection model. This is what it looks, be it looks beautiful, mind. And we, we put in, um, this is for Pangaea, we ran 410 million years of plate, plate surface history to kind of control the dynamics and then allowed the, the material to, to, to evolve inside. The red is, is plumes rising, the blue is, is the oceanic material subducting. And we kind of looked at the observables um, to try and make sure it was still capturing a lot of real life uh, events such as uh, lodging these provinces in the right positions, etc. And we found out on the whole, yeah, for our model, we ran a few, generally did. Um, kind of one thing we looked at was basal heat flux. So the amount of heat that comes out of the core into the mantle. And what we found is that during Pangaea time, there was a kind of a slight increase. And then uh, Pangaea breakup was kind of a flattening. Uh, amongst other things, that was a kind of our fingerprint of a supercontinent. Um, what we found is we also ran plate reconstruction history, and, and this is for those who, are, who like numerical models. These are very large numerical models that took uh, three weeks to run on 800 uh, processes. It's so quite a significant computational time sink. Um, what we found is actually for Rodinia time period, we see that kind of characteristic increase in basal heat flux. But also for Penosha, we saw actually an increase as well in the kind of flattened off, as well as being able to model the central magmatic. Um, uh, so central Iapetus magmatic province, we saw a number of different fingerprints across the two. Um, so by running kind of some simple numerical models, we could see, okay, you know, we, we're starting to see that some things that could happen um, for Pangaea, Rodinia, and Penosha that could be related. So actually for our geomarkers, we've got mantle and subduction dynamics for all three occurring. So we could, Technically, under this framework, say that 
this tiny Pinocchio could be a supercontinent, an introduction into the into the canon of the of the of the famous supercontinents of Rodinia, uh, Pangaea, uh, Ur, and Canorland, and and others. Um, but again, we we don't have a formal definition of a supercontinent. So how can we be how can Pinocchio be added in? Uh, this is the issue. So what makes a supercontinent super? It sounds like an easy question, but actually now we're starting to get more data of how the how how, how life is, how uh, plate history has changed. We're starting to get an understanding that there could be more than one supercontinent, but we can't define them because we don't have a def definition. Um, I don't have an answer to it as well, sadly. I, I don't I, I don't know have a definition. All I know is the perception is that size is the most important in defining a supercontinent. What size that is, I don't know, but Pinocchio would surely never be encountered into that size uh, because potentially, you know, Africa could be counted into as, as a supercontinent today if it did have the relevant geomarkers. So at a bit of a crossroads because we've got a number of different factions within the kind of geodynamics community to try and understand supercontinents and trying to introduce supercontinents, but we don't have a definition. But the perception is size. Can Pinocchio meet, meet that value? We don't know. It, it does kind of sit, it does have a number of different areas where it could potentially, but again, we don't know. So to kind of conclude that area of my talk, uh, what makes a supercontinent super is a focus on size of supercontinent distracted. Should focus on a mantle impact be important? See the definition, the amazing definition of, of, of Daniel uh, Pastor Galan. But if it's going to be related to mantle impact, then we either have to do quite a lot of numerical models to be to, to kind of form that identification. Is that too speculative? Um, do we need something that is more rooted in, in um, observables that you can find at the surface? I don't have answers to these questions, I'm afraid. I have more, probably more, you have probably more questions than answers. Again, if you like that, well, if you couldn't understand what I was saying, I've got a paper on it. Uh, written last a couple of years ago was on Pinocchio's mantle signature, the quest for supercontinent identification, um, which you're you're more than welcome to to delve into. A few minutes. I'm just gonna I'm gonna have an aside to kind of to kind of to perk up the end of this um, uh, this this kind of talk, and we've got about five minutes left. This paper in itself was the first paper I've written with the idea of science communication in mind, bizarrely. And I went out of my way to try and make it accessible. Now, what do I mean by that? Lindsay alluded to this. This is my kind of time for science communication. Myself and Fabio and Grace wrote a paper in 2020 on how to use and not use color in science communication. Um, it's called The Misuse of Color in Science Communication. It's, it's from Nature Communications. I'm just gonna briefly show you um, how it came to impact my life and, and why you should probably at least read the paper. I never give color a passing thought when I was doing any sort of science. Um, it was just something I did rather passively. Um, but actually, it's something that has a really impact on uh, being accessible and inclusive in science, which is something I'm quite, quite passionate about. Let's just take this image. You've got an image here of the Earth and Marie, uh, Marie Curie, Marie Skodoska Curie, and an apple in black and white. This is the an, an, an original image. If you take this image and you apply a color scheme to it, which is uniform in that the, uh, the gradients between the colors is, is evenly spaced, it doesn't change dramatically, you will get pretty much the same image back the, as, the, as the original images. Um, if you apply a color map to this that is, is uneven, that doesn't have that gentle gradient, uh, you get this back, <laughs> um, which now that you know what the image is meant to look like, you can see that this image is distorted. Uh, Mary Q's face is totally distorted. There's loads of red everywhere and the earth doesn't really resemble what you're meant to look like. If, if you know what something looks like, the distortion on certain color maps is really obvious. So if you're looking at data and interpreting data based on an uneven color scheme, you're actually artificially distorting the data. You, yes, you highlight in certain areas, which I think is the reason why people use jet and rainbow style color maps, but actually, as a scientist, you shouldn't distort data. If you have, if you have an axis, uh, you wouldn't change, go from one to two. You would go from one to two. This is what you're doing here with a, just with a color map. Um, this is just a kind of clear example. But if you have an uneven color map and you have someone who has color vision, vision deficiency or color blindness, which 
is about 4% of the population and it's 8% in males. Uh, here, you've got uh, an, an even color map, uh, something that gently changes. You can see with color vision deficiencies, it, you'd be able to interpret that map correctly. Same with these other gentle gradients, uh, even gradients, you'd be able to interpret it correctly. But actually with jet or rainbow, you will be unable to pick where the colors are uh, in the same way and they're actually inaccessible. So by using these sorts of color maps, you're excluding 4% of the population from your science. And science communication, you need to communicate data without distorting to intuitively and to as many readers as possible. Um, so you need to use color maps are perception uniform and CVD friendly. Um, that was something totally alien to me and now I'm a big proponent of it. And um, I'm happy to talk about that at length and, and drop it in uh, to, to, to when, I, when I talk about science. So coming to the end of my talk here, my goals for today, um, introduce yourself and the variety of work that I do. Hopefully I've done that and to say hi. Talk about the Pinocha problem, why we need a definition of a supercontinent. It opens up a lot of questions. And to preach about science communication, which is done, who put preach in there? Terrible. And uh, it is, you become really unpopular actually talking about this sort of stuff, <laughs> but uh, whatever. Um, and to provide you with some inspirational quotes, which you'll find around the department in the ne next coming weeks.